You could be so much more than you are right now. Hi, welcome to church. As we are studying the Word of God and growing in our faith, I want you to know that you really can be much more than what you are today. Uh, I can as well. And how we do this is by growing in our faith. That even if we are in even our most senior years, that there is still a way that we can continually grow in our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, we're going to be going into a deep dive in these next 50 days. You know, we just celebrated Easter and the resurrection. Now we're on the road to Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit filled the church and launched the church. And there was a lot of teaching that Jesus gave when he was reappearing back to his disciples. He was doing a lot of teaching through the scriptures to help them understand what, was, what had happened, what was happening, and what was going to happen with the power of the Holy Spirit coming. And it's imperative for us to have a deep dive as we go into our faith on this road to Pentecost ourselves. And today we're going to start in the foundations of our uh, understanding of ministry, of our understanding of salvation. And we're going to move forward into gifts of the Holy Spirit moving uh, forward in the weeks and months ahead. And so as we do this, I want to encourage you that uh, it is tempting for a person to just kind of glance through the Bible once and think that they, yeah, I get an understanding of the content, but um, you don't have a really deep uh, understanding of it. And you think that that's just fine. I run into people all the time that just kind of have a cursory knowledge of the Bible and think they've got God all figured out. Well, the person who thinks that they've got God all figured out, they don't. Uh, why? God is ineffable. He is uh, transcendent, which means that Words can't describe how incredible he is. He's an infinite creature, if you will. So think about that for a moment. How is this limited being ever going to know the fullness of God in this life? It's impossible. And so though God has made salvation easy, it's a free gift that we receive uh, through Jesus Christ. Salvation is easy for even children to understand and receive. But to know the prerogative of God, to know how to lead in this generation, to know how to interpret the times that we are in requires people of wisdom. And the Bible gives us that wisdom. I also want to encourage you this, that the Bible doesn't tell the truth. The Bible is truth. The Bible sets the stage for what truth actually is. Uh, this is a really important point for us to consider because even when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, the, uh, the governor says to Jesus when Jesus said, this is the truth, and then Pilate says, what is truth? This tells me that Pilate was somewhat of a philosopher in trying to figure out what is the value of what is true and false anyway. And you know what? We have truth being thrown in disrepute today. You know, what was established as long truths for centuries, millennia, has now been thrown into question and said what was, now, what was used to be true is now false. And so we need to understand what is the standard to which we rest truthfulness on, and it is the Word of God. Proverbs says that God's ways are above our ways, and His thoughts are above our thoughts. He is the foundation for truth because He is the foundation for life. He is the foundation for all of creation. And this is why I want to start today on Genesis chapter 1. So we're going to be talking about the Word of God and how God tells the truth and how He sets the standard for what is to come. So it's important to understand that the very word Genesis means origins. It means the, the, the beginning of something. And so with this, that God is setting down a given to Moses what it is that where they came from. Keep this in mind. The, the, when they left the land of Egypt, they went through the Red Sea, uh, the Lord appeared to them on Mount Sinai, gave them the Ten Commandments and the rest of the law. Now, there would have been oral tradition where the past of the contents of Genesis would have been fairly widely known, but the Lord had Moses put the pen and to teach it to the people. Why? Because uh, the, when we look at the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, those were written as the people were approaching uh, the land of Canaan, and they're about to endure war. They're about to go and receive the promise that is written in the book of Genesis. And so the whole purpose of them going into the promised land is because of the promise that God made to Abraham in the book of Genesis. So if the book of Genesis is not foundational, if it is not our origins of where we came from, then they have no business entering the promised land in the book uh, of Exodus and the book of Joshua later. So that's a very important thing for us to, to wrap our head around is that Genesis was written for a very specific purpose to let the people know where they came from and why they're going where they're going and why they need this God who redeems. This is of absolute importance. In case in mind, the book of Genesis was the very first book that we understand that was penned. So they have no other scripture to go by other than the oral traditions. So for God giving the law and for God getting Moses to put this a pen to paper was a monumental thing. So if the things in Genesis are just myth, if the things in Genesis are just stories of old, then how on earth could the stories of old, if they're just myths and were known as myths, then would have never driven Moses and the Israelites 
into the land of Israel. It just wouldn't happen. That's absurd to even think that because there's no other scripture for them to go by. So they're not going to go conquer another nation based upon a myth. Uh, so with that, there is very good evidence to, to back up the statements to which God makes. Why? That's because, again, he's the foundation of truth. So we must understand the truth as he presents it, as he has declared it. And even though there's going to be cultural similarities to the others around, how could it not be? We have very uh, uh, cultural uh, uh, similarities to even people of the Islamic faith in many respects. And in other respects, particularly salvation, we don't. So just because you might be able to find similarities from other mythologies from, say, Egypt or Babylon, that does not mean that that's what Moses was uh, considering as God told him to write things down. Also consider this. The truth is also understood from our vantage, the vantage point to which the writer is writing it. And, and so with this, Moses knew what a day was. So when he's writing their seven days of creation, he understands that. That's corroborated in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, where it explicitly states that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. And that was the format for us having the Sabbath day off, which was so well understood that we are here today still with the seventh day being the holy day. Uh, so it obviously meant what it meant. And next, we understand that even Jesus, who obviously being God, knows that the sun doesn't actually rise and sets, the earth rotates, uh, but yet he still uses the word sunrise and sunset. Not because he's trying to purport false science, but he is just simply giving them a teaching that they don't understand the signs of the Christ coming, and he just gives an example out of their understanding, even though it is an incorrect understanding of sunrise and sunset to them at that point. Now, I can understand Jesus might want to correct that scientific uh, that mistake with them, but then you're off into a whole other conversation and you're missing the point that he's trying to get across. And so with that, as we're going to dive into Genesis chapter 1, we need to realize that the Bible itself claims that it is happened in six actual days. The word day even in it, what Hebrew scholars say, yes, it means an actual day and uh, not an error, you know, we can say, hey, back in my day, you know, that can be then figurative of like, well, what was my day? Was it when I was a teenager? Was it when I was in my 20s? What does that mean? But the qualifications of saying there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day, for example, is qualifications that it was indeed a day. Exodus, written much later uh, in the Ten Commandments, says the same thing. So, you know what, if you believe in evolution and long ages, you already know that and believe that, but I want to teach you from the perspective of that this is actually the true Word of God. Some people might even say, so really what I'm getting at is why I'm in Genesis chapter 1 is, is this, is before we get into it, you need to know that there's a massive theological problem for believing in evolution, for believing in uh, that, that there's mythology in the book of Genesis. And this is it. If God didn't make a promise to Abraham, if God didn't actually create the world the way he said he did, then that means how could chapter 12 be real and chapter 1 and 2 be real, but chapter 3 not be real? So if we throw into question the way that God has presented creation, then we also throw into question the first sin. If Adam and Eve weren't real people, just typecasts, if this is really just a sin myth, then guess what? There's no real sin. And guess what? That means that if Adam and Eve didn't literally sin, then we are not responsible for that because it's just figurative. It's a myth. So then why on earth would we need a savior? The second that you turn Genesis chapter 3 or any of it into mythology, you have literally wiped out the entire Bible. You have wiped out the need for Christ to come because if there is sin, I didn't bring it into the world and I'm not responsible for it. That is a huge theological implication. Now, I know some people just believe in Jesus and don't worry about this Old Testament stuff. And, uh, and if you're that person, well, you know, I do believe, yes, you can have a saving faith and believe in long ages and, and things like that. But I do believe that for a proper theological understanding of it, we're going to do this deep dive. So did you know that the accuracy of Genesis has only been contested for like the last hundred years? It was known throughout all of human history to be completely scientifically plausible that it would happen the way that it is written. And it's only because of a worldview that has crept into our mainstream education system that has uh, thrown that into question. You know, that until about 160 years ago, uh, everybody believed the timeline of the Bible. It was not seen as anything crazy or wild, and it was a great explanation for things around. When you looked at canyons and seeing the fossils on mountains, they're like, well, yeah, that makes total sense with the Noah story. You know, if there's canyons all over the world and massive erosion, well, yeah, we know that the, that the world was created by water and then judged again by water later. So, yeah, like that, that makes sense of what we see matches what we see in the Bible.
Because if you did believe the Bible, you would expect there to be, if there was Noah's flood, that there'd be millions of animals uh, fossilized all over the earth uh, at even the highest elevations. And that's exactly what we find. And so nobody threw this into disrepute until uh, in the scientific community, they wanted to come up with a natural explanation for everything that we see. So that by saying that, by saying we need to find a natural explanation of saying we're taking God out of the equation before we even start our study. Well, that's of course a, a very um, wrong thing to do. You don't start eliminating answers before you even ask the question. You know, we need to look at the realize that there is the evidences and marks on this world are not just natural that there are supernatural events that have happened to this world. And if we eliminate the supernatural from it, then, uh, then we're setting ourselves up for failure, that we can easily get things wrong. Consider this, virgin birth. There's no natural explanation for that because it's a supernatural happening. And because it's a supernatural happening, I'm not gonna be able to come up with an equation to figure that out. I'm not gonna come up with a biological reason for that to happen. The same thing with the resurrection. Dead people don't raise by their own power. You know, so from a natural point of view, the resurrection can't happen. That's absolutely true. But we're not dealing with just the natural. We have the supernatural at play. So if many people in the scientific community have already omitted one major reason for the, the effects in, that we see in the world today, then we are going to be easily duped if that were so. Now, I also want to encourage you that there are a vast array of Christians in every field with incredible degrees that don't believe in that worldview, that they believe that we should still be looking at the supernatural when looking at the natural. The next is this, is that uh, in the, back in the mid-1800s, a concept called uniformitarianism, big long word for you, uh, was used to try to interpret the past. And this is how we ended up getting long ages, it was because what they would say is the key to the past is the present. So they would, so they would choose, this is the way they looked at the past was, okay, we're going to go to the Grand Canyon. We're going to observe it for a few years. Okay, we recognize that that Colorado River digs out, you know, a couple inches each year out of that and deposits it in uh, the Gulf of Baja. And we can ask, uh, then say, okay, if it's a couple inches a year, then, and it's a mile deep, let's divide a mile by, you know, all these inches. Boom, this is how many millions of years old the Grand Canyon is. That's how they date it. It is interesting to note that, yes, they're applying science to this, but they have to have an interpretive grid. Now, there's a difference between historical sciences and operational sciences. Now, operational sciences are things like inventing rockets. You can test it, you can repeat it, and you can observe it. So when you have all those three things, you can then go test again, observe again, see where it went wrong, make some tweaks, uh, observe it, repeat the test, and find your findings. And that's why we can send people to the moon, but it's how we can also get the wrong guy for murder is because police have to use scientific methods to try to recreate the past with assumptions that they've learned from their wisdom. And by, by adding the human element in there, it's not as objective as operational science. It's now a historical science, and we didn't observe it, so we have to try to act as if we did. And so we have to make assumptions to do that. And you know the second that you make any assumptions, you can get it wrong. Consider this. Consider of all the military hardware that has gone into uh, the military complex that is the United States and the intelligence and the satellites and the complexities of all that that have been invented by operational science. But yet back in 2003, they invaded uh, Iraq because they believed they had weapons of mass destruction. Think of this, an organization that basically has a limitless budget, limitless intelligence, mistakenly had wrong intelligence. In fact, other countries did too. Our country opted not to go to the war, they opted a different, different plan, but still believed that there was weapons of mass destruction. Our intelligence failed us, even though the abilities that we had were limitless, even though the, it was incredible the amount of information and resources that were had, but they made a mistake. So if we can make a mistake with the most powerful organization on earth, we need to make sure that we understand where assumptions are being made when we apply it towards science. So anything in the past, you need an assumption or an interpretive grid to be able to apply those science methods to, and that interpretive grid can be faulty. We know that it is faulty. You can't say uniformitarianism is a good way to interpret everything of the past. Consider if somebody came to the site of Mount St. Helens today. Uh, they would uh, come to an agreement thinking that what happened there was thousands, if not millions of years old. Let me tell you this, back in May of uh, 1980, Mount St. Helens, out in the western United States uh, was a giant volcano dormant for so long and it had a mega explosion. The ice cap on top of this mountain melted instantly and it rushed down predominantly one side of the mountain and it dug a canyon 
in minutes. And then as the water started to slow and go into flatter terrain, it not only uh, had uh, buried massive amounts of trees that have now turned into coal and to peat in massive bogs, that the sedimentation from all that has settled downstream into 30,000 separate layers. And all of that happened in one day. And, and we need to understand that, that a catastrophe mimicked what hundreds of millions of years looked like. So if you didn't know that that catastrophe happened, you're gonna be fooled and you're gonna to come to wrong dates with things if you're using the form of uniformitarianism, meaning uniform, the, thing, the key to the past is the present and the current rates of erosion are how it always has been. So it doesn't make room for a catastrophe. And yet our faith demands catastrophe, that God raised up land out of uh, water. So that receding water over top of that would have caused incredible amounts of erosion and, uh, and deposits. Then we learn again that the world was judged through Noah and that it was flooded entirely, that that in itself would have caused massive amounts of trees to be uh, buried, uh, animals, the whole bit. And in fact, for a fossil to even survive, it needs to be buried deep and rapidly so that scavengers don't get it. Uh, otherwise, that's exactly what happens. It's rare to find an animal that has died of natural causes in the woods. It is a very rare thing compared to how many fossils that we have. We have fossils of fish in the middle of eating another smaller fish. Like that had to be really fast if you're getting it mid mid bite here. <laughs> so like we so we see that there are catastrophes of the past, and if we willingly throw away the Bible and we throw away Genesis and say that didn't happen, then we are going to be left with thinking things are much older than they really are. So the catastrophe gives the impression that it is sped up. Now some would say, isn't that God deceiving us that the, the world isn't as uh, as old as what some of these people say? Well, it's encouraging to know that God did not deceive us because he gave us the word of God, the truth, so that we can know it. And we are only deceived if we choose not to understand these things and to read these things. So as I, I give you this, I want to give you this, the foundation of Genesis is so incredibly important to our faith that literally everything else goes off of it. If sin didn't really enter the world in chapter three of Genesis, it, uh, then we're in big trouble. Actually, we're not in any trouble at all because there's no such thing as sin in that scenario. And we don't need Jesus and our faith is in vain. But I encourage you, our faith is worth it because we do believe that God made a perfect world. He handed it over to his first two creation and we have inherited their sin nature and their literal sin. And because of that, we need to be saved and forgiven from it. And we get that through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you with this. As we go into chapter one here, I want you to know that it is not faith versus science. It is naturalistic science or science that includes the supernatural. That's what makes the big difference. We all agree on similar biologies. Operational sciences is agreed upon by everybody because we can test it, repeat it, and observe it here today. But it's things of assumptions of the past of where human uh, assumptions need to be put in that we differ, and there's where we are. So why don't we now go through Genesis chapter one and uh, I'll explain as we go, as each day progresses and what that actually means for us. So Genesis chapter one, verse one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw the li that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning, the first day. So a few things that we can observe out of this very first day is that it is a day. We learn not only does it cooperate in uh, Exodus chapter 20, that these are indeed six days together. There's no separation between verses one or two of millions of years or things like that. But that it also says the evening and morning. That confuses people in the West because we don't have our calendars the same way as the ancient Jews did. Consider that they even wanted in Christ's day, which was 1400 years after, uh, Moses, that they wanted him off the cross by evening. Why? Because for the Hebrews, from Moses all the way to Jesus, sundown was the beginning of a new day. So the dark part of the day from dusk till dawn was the first half of the day in dark. That's why it says there was evening, then there was morning, the morning referring to the light part of the day. And uh, they didn't go at 12 midnight because there's nothing celestial that happens at midnight that would let you know that the day has ended. So they went by the sun going down begun a new day. One day ended and the next day immediately begun. It was not sunrise. It was not 12 a.m. It was sundown. So the first day. So it's also important to note that it says, in the beginning, God. So before anything is creating, God exists, which this is a complete standout to the other religions of the world. 
at the time. Most of them are pantheists, meaning that God is connected to the material. So that, like, that's why the Egyptians believed in a sun god and a river god and a god for just about everything, which is why the ten plagues of Egypt that we will read about later, the ten plagues of Egypt were basically attacks on the ten strongest deities of, of Egypt, saying that my god's bigger than your god. Uh, so it was more than just plagues. It was kind of like God uh, showing that he was more powerful than all of their gods. So most of the ancient world believed that the, that the spiritual was connected to the physical in a phrase we call pantheism, but it was not. In the beginning, God. So God not being physical is important because that's how God can be timeless. If God is absolutely connected to material, that means he's made out of atoms. And if he's made out of atoms, that means that he is bound by time and therefore must have a beginning. And because of that, because he is not made out of material, because we learn in physics, I've explained this in other uh, videos, that because God is spirit and not made out of atoms, we've learned that in physics, that time is linked to matter because time is really a measure of decay. Something has begun, it wears out, and we measure that distance. And whereas God does not decay, he is everlasting, and he is not atoms, time does not apply to him. And so this is why when he says that he is everlasting, no beginning and no end, that actually holds up to scientific scrutiny. This is why we can say the earth must have a beginning, creation must have a creator, but the creator doesn't need to have a creator because we are bound by these decaying atoms. He is not. So in the beginning, God, he immediately, Moses is separating with obviously the Holy Spirit directing, separating out that this God is completely different than anything these people knew in Egypt. So remember, they're going from Egypt into the promised land. They would have had a lot of polluted teachings of uh, the, the God system uh, in the priesthood that belonged in Egypt. A case in point too, this is even kind of remarkable because this would be a turning point for Moses. So Moses being a baby and was grown up and taught in uh, Pharaoh's house would have been taught all the Egyptian ways. And so the fact that God is reteaching Moses even this as well, it's an in the beginning God before all creation. It's setting the stage that our God is the preeminent, amazing, number one, only God above all else. This would have been a complete uh, affront to the Egyptians because they had a connected God connected to everything. So many other creation myths just basically start from the universe going from a form of chaos into order. And, uh, and, but with that, that's where it starts. So what is unique is that, that Moses has God coming first and then creating. Then he says, God made the heavens and the earth and they were formless and void. So meaning he just created the, so that not only is it putting God as first as God, he's putting God before all the others. And so when we go into this, God created the, the heavens and the earth and they were formless and void um, and, the, and the spirit hovered over the deep. This shows that it's God has created, but he is orderly and he is superintending this. With the Holy Spirit floating over the waters, this is really showing special attention to it. That This is not a chaos world. This is not a, uh, like a, somehow it is unchained from God's will. It's like, no, the ingredients are now in the bowl and God is there to see what happens next. And the reason why it takes seven days is really showing that God is a God of order. And so the order that God puts into the laws that they're about to receive later, that this was always a good typecast for us. So God's teaching us, God could have created all one day, but he's also knowing that when he was going to make us, that he needed to teach us. So his order of creation was designed to speak to us. And it does. God created it and he had his hands on it from the very, very beginning. And then so next on this still very first day, we see that he creates light. Now this light, we should probably understand more so in the terms of that it's brought up in Revelation where it says the sun and the moon won't shine, but the glory of God will illuminate everything for everybody. There'll be no night and day, but it'll be only God all the time, just beaming with light, uh, which is interesting because that's, uh, you know, the sun isn't created till day four. So God has provided light and it is almost assuredly that it is his glory that is bringing the light and that he has obviously showed that there's some shaded regions, so he has explained what the night and the day look like. And he shows that purpose uh, a little bit later. But, so we should understand it as light coming as of God's glory uh, reaching out to us, and that helps us to have spiritual insight and light, because there's often talk about spiritual blindness in the Bible, and so God has given us his glory so that we may be able to see, both physically and spiritually. And then let's read now what happened on day two. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters that separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. 
So here we move from God creating the heavens and the earth, that all the ingredients are there, that now God is bringing order. He is separating waters to pool down below and uh, the atmosphere, the sky uh, above. And so we learned that that, uh, that that this expanse is is the sky itself, so that the, there's lots of water that is in the atmosphere. We learn even from Solomon, he's looking at Proverbs and he's writing, how on earth does the clouds have so much water, but yet they don't, that it only falls as rain and they don't collapse beforehand. Um, so it was definitely well understood that there's waters above and waters uh, below. And so that moves into day three. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered into one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on all the land and bear fruit that seed according to its various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants uh, bearing seed according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seeds and according to their kind. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the third day. So on the third day, this would have been major erosion with the uh, earth coming up out of the water. It's really interesting if you look at our continental shelves, we see that the ocean is a deep and very abyssal plains that are everywhere, but that where the continents are, it seems like they just literally come straight up out of the water. It, it's pretty cool if you look at an under, underwater map uh, of the world. And so after the land has now been cleared, now vegetation comes into play. And remember, this is before the sun is created. The sun's not created till the next day. So for those that purport that the world, uh, maybe that it was six eons that God made the world and not six uh, actual days. Well, plants can last one day without sun. They can wait till tomorrow for the sun to come up. They can't wait eons. They can't wait millions of years for the sun to come up. Otherwise, the vegetation would have all died. And so we learned this, that we see that uh, the vegetation has now come up. It is the first of the life that we see that happens on the planet. And so you'll notice that the order of creation is different than the order of, uh, say, that of evolution. And uh, this is important for us to note that this isn't that Moses doesn't understand science. He's talking to God here, writing this down. It's that um, evolutionists have thrown out the word of God in this and they have missed this. And so we, they say that life began in the seas. Well, God claims he made it first on land. Uh, there is no harmonizing of evolution in the Bible. It just, it just cannot be done. So let's move on to the next day to see what happens. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark as seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give the light to the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. So again, an evolutionary timeline would have the uh, would have the sun and the moon, or the sun made millions, billions of years before the earth. But yet we still see that when God made the heavens, he made the earth first. Vegetation came even before the sun. Timelines don't match up. Now the next is this, is that even the stars serve as seasons and signs. Did you know that even like the in the pyramids, there's shafts that show up to daylight? Well, those happen to correspond to um, equinoxes and summer solstice. Why? Because the Egyptians, the, the Nile flooded every summer just about at the equinox. And so it was very important for them to prepare for this flood because it didn't rain in Egypt, that the, the, the flood would come in, water the land, put a fresh new coat of muck down, which would give them fertilized soil, that they would need to plan their whole year around this very short season of growth. Other, elsewise, they had to lug water, <laughs> was, was what it was. So they planned a lot around that, and they measured not just the sun and the moon for day and night, not just to have light, um, but the, the stars, as they moved, uh, with the, as the earth wobbles and circles the sun, they would know when certain seasons are approaching by the stars. Uh, in fact, when we learn things even like Stonehenge and, and many other, um, uh, the astronomy of the ancient world was mostly around timing on how to deal with certain things, like knowing that, okay, if spring had favorable winds for sailing, then they would do so. If the fall had bad, uh, you know, it, it, that was really important for them to know when the stormy seasons were, when the rain would come. All cultures around the world would plot the seasons, and they would use the stars at night to do so, and they would use the sun to govern by day and the moon by night, and the stars would help them uh, as well because of their placement. And so with that, this is really important for them and, it, and why it's explained here on the fourth day. So let's go to day five. 
And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. And God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing and moving within them with the water teams according to its kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And it was evening and it was morning the fifth day. This is really interesting because all the other land-based animals don't get created till the next day, which we'll read in a moment. So we see the fish and then birds uh, long before the beasts of the field. So it is interesting to note that some uh, scientists that don't believe the Bible would say that the dinosaurs turned into birds, but yet dinosaurs weren't even created. The beasts on the field were not created till the next day. Birds were there first. So again, the order does not match up. If we are trying to marry naturalistic science to the science plus faith, uh, we're, we're not going to be able to do a very good job of that here. And, and so with this, this is where he fills uh, the water and the air with his creatures. And the order of this is important. God is saving humanity for last, not because we are the weakest, but for actually this is why he made everything else for us. So this is God saying to us, this is what I have created and I have given to you. Look at the thought and the order and the heart that I have put in all this to give to you. Now go and look after it. But we ended up botching it. Let's move on to day six. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, livestock, creatures that move along the ground and wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness, and let him rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock and over the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food and to all the beasts of the field, and let the birds of the air and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has a breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw the, all that he had made, and he was very good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day God had finished the work that he had been doing, so on the seventh day he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So as you can see, this is really important for us to interpret how we even look at the world. If this is just a myth, uh, we're missing a very huge command here in the beginning. This very beginning, it says that God made all this vast array for us and for us to manage, for us to subdue, for us to, f to fill the earth and to subdue it. Obviously in God's holy ways, because he even calls the next day holy. And with that, God makes it and then he rests. Not that God gets tired, but that when we rest, we say go on vacation. So to go and enjoy the fruits of our labor. That God made us after he made everything else. He said, this is yours. Be fruitful and multiply. Look at this gift that I have given you. Take care of it. And then God sat back and enjoyed and watched what he had created. Unfortunately, we learn a little bit later that we turn against God's holy ways and go after our own. And so with that, this is really the foundation of the entire gospel. That when we look out there, you should look at the trees, you should look at the air that you're breathing, you should look at the food that we have and say, thank you, God, that you have given me all this. And we have a responsibility to manage it wisely and correctly. And so as we go from here, I hope you understand that the, the good gospel that has come to us, that sin has come into the world through humanity in a real, literal way. God has made a creation. He's told us where we're coming from so we know what happened and where we are going. This is really important for us to understand the full theological connection to all of scripture, because all of God's word is God breathed and it will not return void. We should not be dismissive of anything that is in God's word that gives us instruction, especially of uh, why God created us, when he created us, and what is the purpose for us to fix what we broke. Thanks be to him, it is him that has offered us salvation through Jesus Christ, that if we follow him and trust in him for salvation, we will have it. Well, we're going to pick up more on this next week, and, but I want to encourage you to uh, grow in your faith. And if, and if this is significantly new to you and you've got more questions than answers after all this, I want to encourage you and even give a, um, maybe something that might offend you, I don't intend to, I intend to inspire you. 
But if this has made you uh, think, if you've been a Christian for a while and this has made you think, uh, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? And this is all new to you. I'd like to encourage you that you might have been passive in your education, meaning that what you believe about the world is only what people have served to you. So I encourage you, get in the driver's seat of your faith. Let's do a deep dive and uh, explore all things. And if you want to choose to still believe in evolution after this, so be it. We're all going to worship the Lord together. But I want to give you the theological implications of that so that we can be found as approved work people in God's uh, vineyard in this generation. So God bless you. Thank you for joining us for church today. Have a great day. I'm really thankful you've taken the time to watch these broadcasts of ours where we're teaching and putting the good news of Jesus Christ forward. I'd love to get connected with you. I know there are hundreds of people that I don't know yet who watch our material and I'd love to get connected with you to either help you with questions you might have about your faith, to help you get connected to use your gifts in ministry, and, uh, and to see what we could possibly do together to see the Lord do great things in our city and beyond. And so it's an easy way for you to get connected to us is by going on our website at regalchurch.com or emailing uh, us at the office at regalchurch.com uh, your information. We have an electronic communication card on our website. You can get connected to us on Facebook via Messenger and other things like that. So we encourage you that uh, you've watched it. Now let's get connected and see what God can do with you and me and the future as we go ahead. Now, for those of us who believe in the mission of Jesus Christ and want to see it go forward, I want to encourage you that we know that the Bible teaches us to use our time, talent, and treasures to make sure that this good news of Jesus Christ and lots of help goes out to the world. And so with that, uh, we have an email where you can give an email money transfer or hit the address to the church that you can uh, send a check or drop by on church on Sunday. We don't ask offering from our guests, nor do we ask it from those who don't believe. It is a privilege that we as Christians get to give joyfully and be a part of God's mission. That one day when we go to heaven, God is going to point out people that because of our efforts that we helped to get them to heaven. So I uh, encourage you to do this. Generosity is something that uh, many of us do here at the church in order to make sure that this gospel goes out from us. It came to us at a high price. So let's see it, that we can be faithful stewards of this message of Jesus Christ and the love that comes from helping others along the way to see that this gets done and modeled for many others in the days and years ahead. I want to give a heartfelt thanks for those that do give. Your sacrificial giving has made a difference and has reached thousands. 